A very popular misunderstanding nowadays is that the estimation of Scaliger and Pitavius about the timing of the historic events has been confirmed by the modern scientific dating methods. Actually, that is very, very far from the truth, and I will review very briefly carbon dating and dendrochronology to explain why is that so. Carbon dating also known as radiocarbon dating, is a method of determining the age of an object containing organic material by using the properties of radiocarbon, which is a radioactive isotope of carbon. When the animal or plant dies, it stops exchanging carbon with its environment, and from that point onwards, the amount of radiocarbon that it contains begins to reduce as the radiocarbon undergoes radioactive decay. Measuring the amount of radiocarbon in a sample from a dead plant or an animal, such as a piece of wood or a fragment of bone, provides information that can be used to calculate when the animal or plant died. So far, so good. However, the speed of this uh, radioactive decay is unknown. And um, determining that speed is not so easy, so the way they did it was um, taking samples uh, from uh, dead animals or plants whose uh, date of date was surely known and then uh, from them calculate what is the speed of decay of radiocarbon. One of the main events that is cited um, as uh, being taken in consideration while making these calculations of uh, the decay speed is um, the eruption of um, the volcano near Pompeii, which buried the full city together with its residents under a thick layer of ashes. Good, however, the date when that happened was not really known for sure, but was taken from the Scalinger uh, timeline itself. It does not confirm it, it is taken from it to start with, uh, actually, if you click on link number 5 in the description, you will find interesting information pointing out to the fact that actually Pompeii most likely was buried just a few short hundred years ago. I apologize that the information is in Russian. Hopefully, I will find time to make a video about Pompeii as well in the future, but for now maybe you can uh, use some sort of online translation tool if you are really interested in this topic. Besides being based on a known factor, that is the speed of de decay of radiocarbon, uh, to, to add to uh, everything else, the equipment, laboratory equipment that is required for this method of testing is extremely sophisticated and very often, according to the opinion of the modern scientists themselves, it gives absolutely mistaken results very often. Actually, to test a single piece, um, the proper way to do it is uh, to have it four or five laboratories uh, do it absolutely independently and then to publish the results in terms of uh, a range because uh, we always get the results in, in terms of uh, uh, one suggested uh, time. However, the laboratories themselves give a very wide uh, range of time, but we do not get that information. We get um, what uh, some so-called historian interprets that time range to be. And by the way, the radiocarbon dating is almost irrelevant to the time period that we are talking about, which means the last uh, one or two uh, thousand years. That will be the main subject of uh, this series of uh, videos, and especially the last one thousand years. So carbon dating is almost inapplicable to this particular time period because it easily uh, gives inaccuracies of 2000 years. So, I mean, how can it be even applicable for our case? Another problem with carbon dating is um, selectively taking uh, samples, so which means uh, that, for example, a piece of bone is uh, found near a building and is uh, used to find out the date of the building. Actually, it is absolutely possible that the animal to whom this bone belonged lived 
in a completely different time period and not at the time when the given building was actually built. And now a few words about the dendrochronology or three ring dating. The idea behind that is um, that the trees form rings every year and uh, they are very particular, every year they are different according to the different climatic conditions. Different rings form, however, by different kinds of trees and also in different areas. That is why to use this method to date a wooden object we must be sure that the wood has come from this very same area and it is of the exactly same type as uh, the one the scientists have charted for. And now about these charts. For example, we have a hundred year old cherry tree. To continue the chart further in time, we'll need to find another one that is 150 years old. Uh, so some of the uh, rings will be matching and in this way we can continue the graph 50 years further back in time. Then we'll need another cherry tree which uh, was slightly older than the one we had, so some of the rings overlap and so on and so on. What you see now is an actual dendrochronology graph. It contains many white spots. It uh, features few kinds of uh, trees and since they all must uh, come from the same area, these graphs are very difficult to make and because they are broken, they are not continuous, at the end we can see that dendrochronology is becoming a very subjective method of dating and it can be really used in very rare cases because the sample that is required must be big enough and uh, often when the builders in ancient time would use wooden locks they will actually chop off uh, a lot of rings on the side to make a beam and that will make the dating very very inaccurate because who knows when was the tree alive, when did they cut it, when did they use it, when did they reuse it. So to summarize, tree ring dating is absolutely a reliable and genuine scientific dating method, however its application is extremely limited. Before I continue my saga of the survivors' ordeals, I would like to shed more light on the exact moment when the real history was stolen and how exactly it was replaced with semi-truth mixed with sheer fiction. If I don't give more details on how this trick exactly happened, it may not be very clear why the version of history that I am telling you is so radically different from the one you have heard in school. The new version of history was forced upon the society with military power and it happened during the times of the so-called reformation. Those were very turbulent times for Europe. The royal dynasties were changing one after another. For example, in England, the Tudors were replaced by the Stuarts. In France, the throne was taken by the Bourbons. In Russia, the traditional Rurik dynasty was replaced by the Romanovs, who actually did not have any rights to be on the throne. On the background, all these events were orchestrated by the parasites who were applying the method divide and conquer. By that time, they managed to successfully lower the consciousness of the human race to the point 
that there was no need to kill them anymore, the people started killing each other. The actual intention and events of the Reformation are not the ones we hear about today. They are distorted and the proof of that is the very inconsistent story that we hear nowadays. We are being told that the main reason for the revolt of the people was the unlimited power of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, as far as the popes being unpopular, that is absolutely true. However, as far as any actual uh, ruling power is concerned, they didn't seem to have much of that at this point of time. In Spain, in the 15th century, even before the Reformation period started, the authority over the Inquisition was handed over to the king. In year 1515, the French king uh, was victorious in a battle against the allied forces of the popes and Switzerland. After that, the French king had the full right to appoint the clergy and to manage its finances. In more simple terms, he had full control over it. From that time on, even the Pope himself was obliged to consult the French king even when taking decisions concerning his own domain. And even the official version of history agrees with uh, the facts I just uh, told you. Moreover, they tell us that at that time the clergy were as rich as uh, beggars. Often they had to sell cattle to have uh, something to eat. So all this uh, talk of the unlimited uh, power of the Pope is just baloney because at this point, even according to the official history, he did not have uh, much uh, social uh, influence or uh, any other as well as a matter of fact. Since the first official reason for the Reformation is no good, let's see if the others will make more sense. Martin Luther. He is uh, considered to be a seminal figure in the Reformation process. So, uh, he thought Christianity should be nearer to the simple folks and he translated the Bible from Latin to understandable German language. And also he convinced the people that there should be no images in the churches, no statues of the saints. Also, there should be no organ music during uh, church services and also a ringing of the church bells. So, we are offered to believe that because of not liking organ music or church bells during service, the result was complete devastation of entire regions, famine and disease wiping out most of the population of entire countries. War bankrupted most of the combatant powers, severe hardship on the inhabitants of occupied territories, one of the longest, most destructive series of war in European history lasting 30 years. But let's get back to the list of official reasons for the Reformation. The next one is that people felt nostalgia for the old and pure form of Christianity. They wanted to reinstitute it again. That is one beautiful and elegant intellectual concept. However, intellectuals write books and envision educational projects. To the battlefield go those who books do not read. When a peasant upheaval, peasant revolt in Germany started, the very founder of uh, the Protestant movement, Martin Luther, did not support it. He was himself preaching that the peasants should always, under all circumstances, obey their masters. And here is a confirmation of his views in action taken again on from the mainstream history. He ordered uh, the governors at that time to kill the peasants who were revolting quote, like dogs that are sick of rabies. So, the more we read, the more we understand that it wasn't Martin Luther who caused this most bloody series of war. It wasn't the church music either 
or the statues of saints in the churches. Since the realism for these most bloody wars is very uncomfortable for the fabricated history, mainstream historians are trying to invent all kinds of artificial reasons for it and one of it is a real masterpiece of human stupidity. This is how some modern historians are trying to explain the bloody conflict between Czechs and Germans during the Reformation. Too much masculine energy was boiling in their veins and they had no outlet of this energy. I think this is a masterpiece of concoction. By the time this particular conflict was over, the population of Czech Republic had decreased few times. And then their energy stopped boiling and that's why they stopped fighting. Reformation was a very long and very bloody war. It was a purely political event. Why are modern historians trying to present it to us as some sort of intellectual dream about organ music and statues in the temples? The reason, the actual reason, is that all this war was about the parasites trying to break into pieces the empire of the descendants of the survivors and then destroy these pieces one by one. The parasites won the war, but they wanted to get sure that the empire and the knowledge of the survivors will be never resurrected. And for that they decided to fabricate fraudulent history and in that fraudulent history they did not even mention the very existence of the empire. The rest of this documentary will be about the empire of the descendants of the survivors who kept the history about them alive. They remembered who they are and they had still a great deal of the knowledge that survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 